This is part two of the episode on how to write a good MSC smart contract. Part one focused on the preparation stage, security essentials, and testing. Part two is all about gas savings and gas optimization. Let's go. Next category is gas savings. Gas is important at every step of the project's life. It's important on contract deployment, how expensive it will be to put it on the blockchain. It's important when minting, how much will you pay to just be able to mint. It's important when trading, how much will the transfer cost. It's important when trading multiple items, will it be cheaper, will it be more expensive, which is more preferable, batch trading or trading by one by one. In short, gas is important. Gas price is also important. Contrary to the popular belief, the gas prices will not go down after the merge. So we need to think about it and we need to optimize for it. If you have chosen ERC721, the next question is whether to go with 721 or the modified and improved version of 721A, which is optimized for minting multiple tokens. The way it optimizes for multiple tokens is that when you mint more than one, it updates the balance only once instead of for each and every token that you mint. On the other side, because it's written once, it is not as effective at gas optimizations when you transfer your tokens. On average, transferring tokens is about 55% more expensive. So then the question is, and you need to decide for yourself or to think of how your users will be using a project, how often will they mint more than one token? How often will they transfer the tokens? And what's more important for you, for your users over the long term? 721A is more effective already at minting two tokens. And the more you mint, the larger your gas savings. But when minting just one, 721 is more effective than the 721A version. Contracts using ERC721A are obviously Azuki, which came up with uh, this contract version. And a couple more examples are Goblin Town or Moonbirds, the more recent one. Open Zeppelin contracts mentioned previously have many extensions that make your life easier. ERC721 Enumerable is one of such extensions, but I would say that you should never use it or almost never. While it adds more functionality and lets you enumerate over the tokens much easier, but it comes at a large cost. It uses four additional mappings and an array to give you that functionality and each action like a transfer to the user when the user mints or transfer from one user to another needs to update all those mappings and that array making the whole process much much more expensive in gas use mappings instead of arrays the advantage of a mapping is that you can access any value without having to iterate over all the keys in that mapping. The disadvantage is that you cannot easily iterate over all the values because there is no way to get all the values in the mapping. So depending on what you need and what you want, mapping is more effective and cheaper, but also you cannot iterate easily over it. Mint versus safe mint, all the safe mint function does is that it checks if the address that you are giving it is a smart contract or an ordinary wallet. Usually when using open subject contracts, that check is performed elsewhere already and you know that you are dealing with a wallet, not a smart contract. So that check is unnecessary and you are just paying more gas for something that you don't actually need. So mint 
is usually more preferable than safe mint. One of the important features of the NFT smart contract is to handle the allow lists. Allow list is the list of addresses that are allowed to mint the NFT. This could be the addresses that can mint before the public minting starts, or it could be the whole list of the addresses that can mint throughout the whole minting process. So it potentially can be a very big number. It can be hundreds, thousands, or even tens of thousands of addresses. And there is no easy and cheap way to store that in a smart contract. Using Merkle trees solves that. So instead of having to write thousands of addresses, you write only one hash, 32 bytes, and that's it. Merkle trees are actually very interesting in the way how they work. You provide what's called a Merkle proof to the contract and then the contract verifies that proof and compares to the hash that it has and if it matches then it proves that you are allowed to mint. It's a little bit more complicated uh, in terms of minting. First, you need to get that Merkle proof. And second is that the front end of the minting process is also a little bit more involved than just one simple field. But as a result, it's much cheaper for you as a smart contract owner and for those who are minting the project. Take advantage of the unchecked type of blocks. When performing arithmetic operations, you can wrap those operations in unchecked blocks when you are sure that it will not underflow or overflow. And when you use those blocks, then the Solidity compiler will not add additional checks to see if it underflows or overflows. And it's cheaper to use in your contract. This one is an interesting one. Use proper optimizer settings. So what's the optimizer and what are the proper optimizer settings? The default is 200. And for example, when you create a new project in Hardhat, this is what you see there. Optimizer enabled true runs 200. So what does this 200 mean? It means that it will run 200 times when compiling the bytecode which is what will be deployed on the blockchain. And when it compiles the smart contract, in a way, it tries different ways of doing something like more automatic or more manually, more like hard coding into the compiled code. When it's more manual and more hard coded, then the resultant bytecode will be larger to deploy but then it might be cheaper to run those functions. So it checks many different versions of larger, smaller, more optimized, less optimized versions of the smart contract and comes up with the best one. And the more times you run it, the higher the chance that it will come up with something that is more optimized for you or for example cheaper to run the functions and in fact there is no such number as a proper optimizer setting 200 is a default but you should definitely test less more and even much more like 200 1000 5000 up to 1 million which is probably an overkill but for example uniswap which runs thousands or millions of transactions per day uses. So usually the larger the number, the better, but it can also result in a more expensive deployment. So it's a balance and something that you need to decide for yourself. Let's see what this setting looks like in a few NFT smart contracts of the current projects. This is Moonbirds they went with default 200. This is Goblin Town. They went also with default 200. Azuki, they went with 500. So they probably tested a few settings and 500 was what worked best for them. 
and this is Uniswap. It's a completely different type of smart contract. It's DeFi, it's not NFT, but they have a million. So test at least a few settings, see what works for you, go with it. Don't assume that 200 is the best for you. There is a thing called variable packing in Solidity, where when you have some variables that do not need to be a large number or will never be a large number, then are set as instead of uint 256, for example, uint 8 or 96 or anything in between. The assumption is that with packing a few variables into one 256 bit slot will save you gas, but more often than not, or actually almost always, it will not save you gas. And in many instances, it will even cost you more. So the rule of thumb is that just don't use anything other than you in 256 and you should be fine. Something I mentioned previously already briefly, don't use public if external will do. Both external and public allow outside calls to the function or access to the variable, but uh, external does not allow to access that from the contract itself. But if you do not need to access it from the contract itself and only need to allow outside calls, then you don't need for the variable or function to be public. So that saves on gas because Solidity doesn't have to allow for two entry points. So go through the function list and see if it needs to be external or if actually if it needs to be public or external is enough and save on gas. Unbounded loops. This is a very dangerous thing. So whenever you loop over an array that users can add to uh, or actually push uh, one or more entries to it. There is always a danger that the array can become too big. And at some points it might not even fit into the block limit. And whatever exceeds the block limit cannot be executed on blockchain. So at some point, if your array is too large, your smart contract cannot do anything with it. And that's actually it. Your smart contract is frozen. So whenever you see a loop over an array that users can control and add to it, that's a red flag. That's a big red flag. You can also be too cautious and, for example, add unnecessary re-entrancy protection to different functions. But if that specific function doesn't transfer ether or makes external calls, then adding that protection just wastes gas and you do not need to do that. So again, going through the functions and thinking what they need to do or what they don't need to do and then adding or not adding that reentrancy protection. Next is a small improvement, and it makes sense only when it is called many times. So for example, in a loop, do not read from the storage variable twice in one transaction. So when you have a loop and you compare it to array length, so every time you do that, you calculate that array length, and you do not need to do that because that costs gas, it's better to calculate it once and put it into a local variable and then use local variable when comparing. There is another optimization in play mentioned previously, unchecked. When you know that this counter I++ cannot go below zero, it does not to be checked for overflow and underflow. So you have an unchecked block and array length in a local variable. So this function is much more gas efficient than this one. And the larger the array, the more savings uh, you will have with this function. But all of these optimizations mentioned up to this point are not as important as this one. So this is an overarching rule of gas optimization. 
It's avoid reading and writing to the blockchain as much as you can. Each activity in Solidity has a gas price. So for example, this is the list of opcodes. Addition, three gas. Multiplication, five gas. Exponential operation, 10 gas. Jumping to a different place in the contract, probably around five. Less than comparison, three. Computing a hash, 30. But these are the two that matter. These are the only two that matter in gas optimization is that reading from storage is 800 and writing to storage is 20,000. So whatever you save on those three, five or 10 gas, if you make a few improvements in reading and writing, so that you don't write unnecessarily a couple of times or don't read unnecessarily a few more times, then suddenly your whole smart contract can be much, much more efficient than when you use all the tips and tricks of the gas savings. So this is the most important one. Don't read and don't write if you don't need that. And the way that you can do that is that you can minimize on-chain data. You don't have to store everything on-chain. Some things are essential and need to be on-chain, but not everything. Some values can be stored on-chain, but if, for example, value C is a combination of value A, a and B, you do not need to store value C on chain as well. You can calculate it off chain and have a C as a result. Next one, use events. So when some important operations are performed by the smart contract, you can emit an event and you can have different values stored in those events. And then those events and those values can be accessed off chain and do not need to be stored on chain as well. And again, if you don't need to write to blockchain, don't write. But if you do need to write, don't write multiple times. Do all the calculations and manipulating of data in memory and then write if you need to. This concludes part two of the episode on how to write a good NFT smart contract. Next part will be about smart contract deployment and about minting, which is a critical stage for any NFT project.